So um, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And as I was saying before, this is my first opportunity uh, to talk to a student chapters. And I try to prepare first a little overview of what we do in the lab, and then talk a little about my experience as the founder of two companies. The first one, Interactive Motion Technologies, that I founded in 1998. So it's the oldest company or was the oldest company uh, in the space of rehabilitation robotics. Um, I sold it in 2016 to a French uh, group. Uh, and after that, in 2017, I founded a second company that is still like in its infancies. So um, I have a, a pretty decent team uh, of exceptional people in the group. Some of them, actually most of them, had already left the team. Uh, to do better things, uh, but I'll try to highlight just to start a little of the different things that we do in the lab. Not everything is on rehabilitation robotics. We have two other areas, uh, just to give you a broad view. One is agriculture robotics and the other one is digital transformation. And I'll try to also to give a few examples of these uh, two other areas in addition to rehabilitation robotics. So rehabilitation robotics, uh, when I started my PhD in 1989, um, we took to heart an understanding that was percolating neuroscience that uh, the brain of an adult uh, was plastic. So until the 70s and 80s, we did not understand that the brain of an adult could create new connections. Uh, so to some extent, um, that's why we can claim some uh, pioneering uh, contribution to this space. Because what we did is that understanding that neuroscience was telling us that the brain was perhaps plastic and new connections could be created, there was an opportunity to try to influence nature and nurture recovery. So I started in 1989 to develop what became known as the MIT Manus Robotic Gym. Uh, just as a comment, um, MIT motto is uh, Mens et Manus, uh, mind and hand. So that's where I took the name MIT Manus. And we have developed different uh, devices, not only to train the shoulder and elbow, but also the wrist, make uh, spatial movements, as well as open and close the hands. We later expanded also for the lower extremity. Um, but in addition to that, uh, we take the devices and we do also, we measure how people perform. So, for example, recently I had the work of Juan Carlos Perez and also of Caio Benati uh, to look at the different uh, uh, abilities that patients would have from admission to discharge. So on the left side, for example, and let me try to annotate here. Uh, on the left side, you have like a patient trying to make a like a star type movement hitting different targets. And you see what they are able to do at admission, how they can also draw circles and uh, how they can use the wrist to point also like in a star shape. Now you see this at admission and then you see them at discharge and you can see this for different levels of patients. And uh, what you can then do is characterize patient recovery based on uh, these outcomes. Let me now uh, erase this, otherwise we'll be seeing this in the next slide also. So let me take down these marks and uh, move to the next slide. Um, And, uh, um, but in addition to that, we had been working in other areas like agriculture robotics, for example, this is the work of Moisés Alencastre Miranda and also Joe Davidson. 
So with this, uh, and I forgot to mention Michael Schroeder. So for example, in this area, what we are doing is that we are trying to identify weeds uh, in the middle of sugar cane. So using computer vision, we try to identify when we see weeds. And by doing this, what we can do is that use herbicide only when you identify weeds, reducing the amount of herbicide that is placed on the soil. So this is another different type of effort that we had been pushing uh, to try to minimize the amount of herbicide that is dispensed on the soil. Instead of just carpeting the whole soil with herbicide, we use uh, computer vision to try to identify the presence or absence of weeds. Uh, and this is very difficult because in this case, the weed and the sugarcane are inter, um, they are in the same spot. There is a lot of overlap between the two. And uh, you might or might not know, sugarcane is a grass from Asia, and most of the weeds are also different forms of grass. Um, let me jump a little forward. The other effort, again, Moisés Alencastre Miranda and Andres Martinez Guerra. This is the effort on developing digital transformation, trying to create tools for, um, uh, people in industry to try to bring more technology and training to new operators. So what happens is that in many applications, you have uh, operators that have performed their task for a very long time and they become extremely good. But uh, when you have new operators, typically there is no training schedule for them. Uh, there is no way to train them. And um, the only way is through practice. And we would like to uh, accelerate the learning process and perhaps uh, try to nudge um, the performance of the um, naive operator to approximate faster what an expert operator is doing. And in this case, what we are developing is a simulator to do this for excavators in this case. But you can see that there is a similarity here between rehabilitation robotics and this space, because in both cases, we have the expert or the person without disabilities. And then we have the naive subject or uh, in this case, the naive operator or the person that, for example, had had a stroke uh, to try to relearn um, uh, the tasks. So this is how uh, there is a lot of, uh, of similarities between the two spaces. Now, um, another area that we have been developing, this is the work of Satoshi Nishimura and Ronapi. Um, Chai Charong, um, that is like trying to develop different forms of actuators. So in rehabilitation, many times, for example, on the right side here, I'm showing um, the, uh, I'm showing like our pelvis robot that gives support to a patient during gait tasks. And we want the robot to allow the patient to express movement freely. But on the other side, when the patient might trip, we want to hold the patient. So you have two very different points of operation. In one case, you want a device that is highly back drivable, that gets out of the way and allow the patient to express movement. On the other case, we want a device that has an actuator that can deliver very high forces to hold the patient and prevent them from falling. So we want a device that can do both of this type of, uh, of tasks. And this is not very easy. So we have been trying to develop actuators to do this type of uh, thing. So here is an example using feedback to try to change a device that normally is not back drivable to become back drivable. Or we use um, electro-rheological, magnetorheological fluids to create devices that can also change their properties. 
or we change actually the mechanical structure of the device. So then when we interact, like in this case is a, is a cantilever that depending on the force applied and the desired impedance, we change the point of support of this mechanical interface. So these are examples of things that we also have been doing. And let me erase again these marks. And um, um, we also have been developing sensors for some applications where we want not, uh, based on computer vision, not only to see the task, um, but also be able in some cases to measure force simultaneously. In many cases, for example, you have a camera that is driving the robot to approach the object. But then as you get closer, um, the robot itself is preventing the camera from seeing the object. So then you place a second camera on the end effector to try to interface with the object. But what we have been developing are sensors uh, that take care of the blind spots and also measure the distance um, while uh, maintaining uh, the appropriate contact later on. So these are the kind of sensors that we develop using optical uh, components, not only to measure the distance to the object, but once we touch the object to actually let us measure uh, forces. Uh, last but not least, uh, in the same effort, uh, we also design other types of actuators. So here is an example of a motor, is a planar motor in two dimensions. So we essentially uh, not only can move, but we can also rotate the device. So for example, if you would want like the, to design like a planar robot, you could like, design a different form of, a, of an electrical motor that essentially is doing the same uh, principles, but just spreading around the object that you want to control. Now, what I'm going now to do is move a little to rehabilitation robotics and show you a video. Uh, and you'll have to tell me because I forgot to click about sounds when I started to share if you can uh, here the video it was very nicely done by a group that was trying to raise funds, but it's a cute video. Can you hear? Uh, we can't hear anything, I don't think. Okay, so let me stop. And stop sharing. And I apologize for that and share again, but now I have to click optimize video share sound okay and uh let go back here and you will tell me if you can hear right now the the promising thing is to deal with and support this re robotic research the research that's been done with robotics is really exciting because it was taught for years that following an injury like a stroke, you just didn't get better. That was the perceived view at the time that perhaps there wasn't that much that we could do to harness and nurture recovery. Now I think, uh, especially given all the research that has been done through the decade of the brain, we have had tremendous advances in neuroscience at every level. There seemed to be something you could do about restoring motor function in patients with stroke, re-educating the brain with robotic therapy. This was almost 20 years ago when we started making this development. And we know the child's brain is much more plastic than an adult's. Our thought was, well, if adults can make these gains, then perhaps children with CP can make even greater gains. In adults, there's a lot of data. In children, we're just starting. We always have to remember the ultimate goal of what we are doing, that is to change the way physical medicine has been practiced in the past and make it the way of the future, of the 21st century. We have seen in our initial studies gains that were completely unexpected. 
Every week she seemed to do better and better. Yellow. She came in today and she seemed to master it. Well, good job. It's important in order to keep people engaged. It's important to keep them active. And finally, it's important to allow them to be challenged. They really need to feel the movement and not hear it from us. I think it's really exciting when the children look in the mirror and see themselves walking and get that feedback that they really get a sense of accomplishment. Robots can also be used for measurement to help to evaluate uh, how the patient is performing. I'm looking at the gait cycle of the patient that we've just analyzed. She was able to walk with a walker, but after getting trained, I did 12 sessions with her, and she was now able to walk full-time with bilateral crutches. There's positive changes in walking function, standing function, walking speed, and walking endurance. And the initial results are very promising. Transfer from use of a walker to use of crutches, use of crutches to starting to walk independently. Hi everyone, this is Evan and I'm not using my crutches that much anymore. And I'm very proud of myself. I think there's tremendous hope for cerebral palsy. So I didn't hear anybody, so I'm guessing you guys could hear me. Yes. Good. So let me now start talking yes, about, okay. the, about the topic of, uh, of how to start uh, or a little about my experience starting companies. And I like to start this by talking about uh, what is called the Valley of Death. Uh, this is like, you know, what happened after you get some research done and you get some seed money. And then um, there is a period after the seed money from the moment you have a, your essentially product launch until you get to the point where you might say that you are starting to take off. And just as a curiosity, um, typically this period can be from lasting decades. There was a paper not long ago um, that was saying that from the moment that we develop something in a university to the moment that it shows in the market, it typically takes around 18 years. So let me repeat, it typically take around 18 years. Um, now, it's interesting to look at the way uh, research is organized. So this is, um, and I don't know if you can see the whole screen, but this is actually a university um, um, defense acquisition university where they actually discuss how to try to organize um, the defense acquisition in order to try to foster growth. Now, many of you might have heard of uh, uh, Vannevar Bush. He actually graduated at MIT in 1916, and he created what is presently known as the military academic uh, uh, industry um, uh, complex. And his view was like basic, like, you know, shown here, where he is, um, was saying how we should try to organize uh, research. And basic idea is that in this case, the Department of Defense and uh, um, um, the executive branch would um, ask uh, Congress for a budget, the Congress would decide what is the budget that would be allocated. And then based on that, they will uh, request different government agencies to try to, um, um, to, you know, talk to universities and talk to industry 
through request of proposals and competition and then placing money and getting back innovation. And from the industry, it would go to the market. Typically between university and industry, there is no exchange of money in this model, but of knowledge, know-how and people. This is interesting because when the model was developed um, around um, 1940s, uh, it essentially was placing the government as the main cog moving both academia and industry. But they did a few things. They, one of the aspects is that they did not support it uh, research or work in liberal arts or social sciences, only in, in engineering and science. Um, they typically focus in knowledge and know-how. And as you can see, there were several different agencies that would be uh, working on behalf of the government to try to foster this growth. Now, um, this was multiple models. So if you look to NSF, the National Science Foundation, there were two big models that were proposed uh, that led to, uh, that could have led to very different styles of support for science. Um, and the one from Vannevar Bush was the one that um, essentially uh, was adopted. So in a sense, um, we have a vague mandate. Um, the scientists and others are the ones that would judge uh, the proposals. They will try to focus mainly in basic, and I'll talk a little more about basic. Uh, they will give non-exclusive licensing to the universities, but they would not support social uh, sciences. And if you think from this perspective, and you, some of you might have heard this uh, initials before, TRL, uh, Technology Readiness Level, the universities and academic centers would primarily focus on what is called level one through five, while industry would typically focus between level five and nine. So when you have the cog in one side, the, the government placing requests for universities or for industry, there was only one level more or less that there was some overlap on the initiatives. Now, this is model was then adopted in different countries. This is the model that was adopted in Japan, the MITI model. Uh, Ministry of Industry, Technology, and I forgot what is the last I stands for. They also don't have support for liberal arts, but they also hear differently from the US. They were very heavy on D, uh, not much in basic research in the beginning, and they were focusing primarily in supporting the export uh, industry. Um, and there was no negative in not being necessarily original. Uh, there was perfectly fine in taking ideas from abroad. Uh, the model later was adopted by Korea and uh, was exactly very similar to the Japanese model initially. And as in Japan now, both Korea and Japan are now shifting a little away from just the D uh, in R&D to rebalance a little and also do more basic uh, research. Uh, in Europe and in South America, the model is a little different. So instead of having the government turn the cog that would move academia and separately move industry, in Europe, at least with the exception of Germany, the model is that the government agencies, they turn the cog that actually would move the academia. And academia is the one that would then connect with industry. So this has one positive thing that is much easier for you in one sense to have the seed money to start something. Uh, but in the longer run, uh, there are some disadvantages because you create a dependency between industry and academia. 
uh, the German model is like, um, it's the opposite, where the money from the government, instead of going to academia and then industry, it goes from government to industry and from industry to academia. So those are alternatives for the model that we adopted here in the US and also in the Far East uh, that are more similar. Uh, the main difference, the Far East, they were focusing mainly on the export while here in the US we were more balanced in the R&D. Now, if we think about rehabilitation, we would have something kind of similar. Uh, you would have uh, the Secretary of Health uh, ask the Congress uh, for budget, and then the government and philanthropy would interact with academia and industry. But the big difference between this and the typical academic uh, industry government model, uh, uh, the military academic um, industry comp complex, is that here you have the users that are very important source, both of money as motivation, which is not as uh, common in the other model. Now I'm going to change a little more and talk about the consequences of this models just to give you ideas. And of course, last year was totally abnormal. So this is a slide that I did in 2019. I went to the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, and I got the data on the gross national product or the GDP. PPP, so it means um, uh, uh, purchasing power parity. So essentially you are saying different things cost different in different countries, but if you look how many, how much it costs for you to buy something in different countries, you can kind of normalize them. And I plotted here from 1980 and until where they had, they were estimating this until uh, 2024. Uh, they always project five years forward. And again, this is data from 2019. And you can see here is that the two top green uh, dots represent Ireland and the top one, Singapore. Below that, you have the US uh, in this kind of uh, orange color. Below that, you have the Europeans and the Japanese model. Um, and below that, you have the countries that, of what we call developing countries. Now, if we take this and we normalize, so like here I have them, they start in different values in 1980. Now, if I normalize and make them all equal to one, you have like these different curves. You have a few very sad stories that would be like Venezuela, the very dark, the, the blue right at the bottom. Uh, you have Russia that is this brown that went from the Russian Federation that from its dissolution, it's, it lost a little, but now has been recovering. Uh, then you have on the top again, um, Singapore, uh, Ireland, the dark green is the US. Uh, below that you have countries in the middle with Korea, which is hard for you to see, but Korea is this brown in the middle. So they started roughly like countries in developing and then they jumped to the category and now they are in the middle. Um, of the developed countries in terms of growth of GDP, PPP. Um, just repeating what I said before, I don't need to spend more time here. So I did talk a little about um, how I see res like, you know, the, the research being organized at a national level. But then we can go down to look to how things are organized um, more in a smaller places or like more in industries. And I think it's good for us to think when we think about organizations, uh, the different types of ways you can organize things. So you can have hierarchies, you can have democracy, 
you can have communities and you can have ecosystems. So uh, just for the sake of talking a little about each of those hierarchies are very clear, a top down um, organizations where like the top are making decisions and passing down. So the next level would execute and then the thing keeps going down, but it's all decided at the very top. Then you have other organizations that are more like democracy where uh, um, the majority rules, meaning the majority uh, decides what is the path and the minority uh, move with it. Then you have communities and communities are organizations where you have to create consensus for everybody. So you cannot have 51% uh, favoring something and 49 favoring something else. Um, that's not an acceptable uh, way for you to make decisions because you have to bring everybody together, otherwise you lose the 49%. And then you have the ecosystems. And I'll talk a little more about the ecosystems as we go forward. Just talking about hierarchy, and I, I found these two examples that I think is quite interesting, one representing government and the other one representing companies. These are like a picture from uh, 90, I think 1981 of Kendall Square, which is where MIT is based, like next to the river. But a little inside from the river, um, you had this massive area that was all open. And just as a curiosity, this where was NASA was supposed to be. Uh, so um, instead of you hearing Houston, we have a problem. It was supposed to be Cambridge, we have a problem. But then as a hierarchy, Kennedy uh, was assassinated and uh, um, the headquarters was moved to the area where the next president came from, that was Texas. So in 1981, we had this massive area that was prepared to be uh, NASA headquarters uh, or, 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 or control center, and it was essentially vacated. Um, so this is an example of hierarchy where the top make decisions and then you see down there what might be the consequence. Another example, not far from this, across that white street that is Main Street, you had another big company called Polaroid. This is one of the last uh, pictures of left from it because the company doesn't exist anymore. Actually, all those buildings now are MIT properties. So this is how the thing changed from 1981 to 1998. Uh, major growth, you still can see like that green more or less in the center where some of the buildings where NASA was supposed to be have been occupied. But this keep changing and we could even like go today. Let me see, where did we show up here? And try to... Let me see if I can see where we are and just have a look here to Kendall Square. And uh, for example, take the satellite image and see how the thing had been changing quite significantly in this time. So you still can see here a little areas that represent where NASA was supposed to be. Um, that has just what was remaining had just been acquired by MIT. MIT originally was just only here. Actually, here you have the main building from MIT. And all this area here was Polaroid. And now we had expanded everywhere. Um, so these are examples of um, um, what sometimes, let me see what sometimes you get when we um, um, have hierarchy.
So um, let me uh, continue talking a little more about rehabilitation robotics and the opportunity to create companies in this space. And um, let's look in robotics in general. This is an old slide from 2016 telling us how um, robots, um, how many robots you have for every 10,000 employees. And what we can see here is that um, um, you have several countries like South Korea, Singapore, Germany, Japan, with a very nice density of robots per industrial or industrial robots per 10,000 employees and other countries more in the middle. Again, this is not a new slide. And you could even go a little more backwards uh, in 2010 and have a look to the different spaces and different countries. And you can see, for example, that if we look to, this was 2010, so we should like try to get a more updated 10 years later. But in Europe, uh, most of the robotic efforts were in automotive in general industry. Um, Japan was primarily in automotive. Uh, this is the middle uh, blue here. Uh, while in the US, most of the effort, uh, in addition to automotive, was more in what we call service uh, robotics. Uh, so here we might go to this conversation about um, the ecosystem and why an ecosystem might be important. We did before talk about hierarchy. I didn't tell you much about democracy or community because they are less valid for, for when we are thinking about new enterprises. But then um, one thing that is uh, important is when we move down to the ecosystem. And this idea um, that uh, if we think in a Darwinist way, the only, uh, the fittest person or organization would prosper in a competitive environment. Now, um, if we look to uh, the space that I said was growing quite a bit here in the US service robotics, uh, we can see that this should perhaps grow even further here. A um, couple of reasons. Um, one of them is aging of the population. Uh, the expectation is that in 25 years from now, there will be more people over 60 years of age than children under five. So that's a significant pressure to try to create more, more agents to, to help uh, this aging population. And here you have like an example from the UN uh, telling us what's the population over 65 years of age, what are their projections. And you can see that Japan, in 2050, the expectation is that over 65, you would have 38% of the population. In Europe, close to 30. The US, we actually are uh, the youngest of the developed nations. Uh, so we have the baby boomers now retiring, but will be still close to 22% of the population over 65. And the same issue is going to happen in developing countries. So the lower line here, the dark green is India. Uh, that would have around 15% of the population over 65. So um, what we could do is try to create technology to try to help in this type of problem. And we know that aging is the biggest factor in uh, several conditions related not only to neurological, but also orthopedic, uh, uh, rheumatic conditions. And that with the better uh, uh, advances in the medical field, there will be even more people requiring assistance. So uh, this is a major challenge in terms of social and economic uh, adaptation for society. 
And uh, in some areas, those would be even more uh, important. So as an example, I didn't show you in that graph about aging, but China, for example, is aging remarkably fast and will be closer to Europe uh, in a few years because of their one-child policy. But contrary to Europe, there is no social network yet or social services organized in China. So there is a significant uh, push there to try to uh, create uh, this type of technology to address a problem that they um, haven't prepared yet for. And uh, under this, we could look to this technology to develop to all these different spaces. And that's opportunities for each of you uh, as you um, move forward in your careers to try to see where perhaps in this uh, continuum of care, you could contribute uh, bringing different uh, technologies, not just for the inpatient hospital or outpatient clinic, but also for visiting services, for the home rehabilitation, and also for uh, aging in general. And talking about this, uh, one area that we had spent quite a lot of time is in stroke. Uh, there are more than seven, around 7 million stroke survivors in the world, in uh, the US with 50 million stroke survivors in the world. And this number is expected to grow dramatically with the aging of the population. So I'll show you here another view. Thanks for watching and stay with us. There's much more ahead on CNN, including today's edition of Pioneers. Take a look. MIT scientists Hermano Ego Krebs and Neville Hogan are using robots to help stroke victims with brain injuries regain movement. Their arm robots have already helped patients move shoulders and wrists, enabling them to do things they couldn't do for themselves, like shower or put on clothes. It isn't just a matter of moving. We are seeing something that looks like we're influencing a change in the brain. And I think that's probably the most important thing we've seen so far. Now they're focusing on the lower extremities with ankle bots, which they hope will not only help patients walk again, but also help avoid dangerous falls after their strokes. The robots work by providing a video game on a screen, which prompts users to perform an exercise. If they don't make that movement within a certain period of time, then the robot will initiate it. If they do make a movement within that period of time, the robot goes along and helps them. So what we think is happening is that the visual display evokes the intent to move. A short time later, movement actually happens, and that sensory information comes back up to the brain. A future goal is to one day have an entire robotic gym for all parts of the body. So this actually is uh, 15 years old, showing like a hospital in New York area. Uh, so here I'm like showing a little of the timeline, mixing both the, the academic space and also the commercial space. So um, I started developing what uh, my PhD, the MIT Manus in 1989, uh, when I started to, to, to do my graduate studies at MIT. 1994, I deployed this technology in hospitals in New York area. And we started collecting clinical results. We started this company, Interactive Motion Technologies, as a bootstrap. Uh, uh, we put $1,000. That's how we started the company in 1998. And we started this way uh, because around that time, nobody perceived that there was a need for it. So when we talked to large companies to, for them to license MIT technology, they were not interested in it. They liked the results, but they didn't see um, financial returns behind it. So we continue developing and testing. And by 2010, uh, the American Heart Association and the VA um, looking to our results for the upper extremity endorsed the use of robotics for the upper extremity. We had results published in 2010 in the New England Journal of Medicine and more recently in um, 
um, in a study that we perform in the UK uh, with 770 stroke patients um, that we published in 2019 in Lancet. Now it's the moment, if you see, um, roughly, we are talking about those 18 years from the moment you leave the, the academia. Uh, we felt that was the moment to grow. And so we sold it to this French group um, in 2016, Interactive Motion Technologies. So uh, if you look to this, you might see there that we reflect quite nicely this kind of curve. Maybe we don't know how much time it takes, but if you look, we were a pre-seed company in 1998, doing primarily research and uh, a few clinical sites. And then we did more development to hit the phase of major product launch around 2010. And then there was a funding gap that was typically it's called the valley of death, where it's very hard for you actually to pass between the two phases. And around 2016, we felt that we were in the moment to take off and sold the company. But here come a few interesting things. These are public companies. I didn't want to take very recent numbers, um, uh, but um, I took numbers from January 2020. So one year, a little over a year old results. Showing that um, uh, they accumulate a deficit, and this is public information, at that time was $55 million, and their shares had dropped dramatically. Perhaps another company that maybe you are my, more familiar was a company called Rewalk. They make exoskeletal robots for people with spinal cord injury and perhaps strokes. And what you see is that when that company came public, if you take in consideration all the reverse splits and others, um, the value of the stock would be $775. And in January 2020, it was being traded at 2.16. So huge uh, drop and a very large uh, accumulated deficit. So uh, this is something that is very uh, important to look and for you to consider as you start your company to understand in what phase you are and who to talk to. Because uh, there are three things that are important when you will build a, a company. And here I'm saying a real company. And it's like a stool. You need three legs to keep it standing. You need money, you need good personnel, and you need good science or technology. And uh, what happened with those companies, why they went down badly, is that they only had two of those three in both cases and in most cases. And so you need, like, again, thinking on this, be thinking where to try to get one of those that is the money story. So most of you had heard about venture capital and most of you are excited about talking with them. But this is data that um, I collected in 2018, actually in 2019. Um, uh, I didn't want to, to look in 2020 because it was a very odd year. But if you look here and um, if you look to how many VCs are in the US, um, there are around a thousand active VCs. You might say, what is active VCs? Means they must have done at least one deal per year. There are many companies that claim to be VCs, but then if you look to their history, they didn't support anybody. So they hear a lot of ideas. I don't know what they do with those ideas, but they certainly... Uh, would not qualify as an active VC because they haven't funded anybody. So if you look to those a thousand company, a thousand VCs or VC funds and see how many deals were done in 2018, you see that in average in Meditech space, you have around 218 deals per year. And for smaller 
companies, what I call early stage medical device companies, which are most, um, I su suspect most of us, we are starting things brand new. In 2018, there was only 10 deals, 10 in this country, 10 deals for early stage medical devices. So this is one of the stools. So you'll have to think more how to, um, to get that aspect that was related to money. The second one is about people. And one of the things actually that was quite interesting was people look at companies that were successful and how many um, founders were per company. And what you see is that most of them, very few had only one. Actually, it has been shown that companies that have more founders, active founders, do much better than the ones that have just one founder, one active founder. So this is part of the idea of creating, um, having the people uh, to pay attention to all the details needed to, to nurture the company to grow. And not to say the least, you also need to have the right technology. So if you don't have these three things, you won't be able to make um, the company grow. But one thing that is even more important than these three things is timing. Many times, and if you talk to or hear uh, most of the people that are highly successful, they'll tell you that timing is the most important uh, aspect of everything else. And talking about timing, I'm precisely at 7 p.m. my time. And then I'm going to stop here and thank you again for listening to me and I'll try to answer questions. Sure, thank you uh, for your lecture. I, uh, I don't know, I don't think anyone's said anything in the chat thus far, but actually I have a question concerning rehabilitation robotics. Um, I'm not sure if you explicitly mentioned it or maybe I didn't quite catch it, but how do you see it projected? Uh, because I know you did give two examples where companies did um, kind of accrue a large deficit. Correct. So, um, so there are um, two different trends. So the first trend is that you have very large companies entering this space. So for example, Toyota has now a group, uh, Toyota Partners Division, that is developing this type of technology rehabilitation robotics. You also have Samsung. You also have Honda, Parker Hanifin. So you have large corporations now understanding that there is a potential for growth in this area. Uh, and then you have the smaller companies. Uh, the smaller companies that were created uh, literally 20 years ago, for the most part, um, essentially did run its course. Um, and they would either need to consolidate or there will be the opportunity for the newcomers to enter in that small space, in the, the small company space. So you'll have two different, very distinct groups, either the very large ones or newcomers that would bring, uh, because the timing uh, wasn't right. So when I mentioned that we originally didn't try to create a company in 1998, we actually tried to get large companies to uh, license the technology from MIT. For example, I met with the chief technology officer from Medtronics in 1997, 1998, and he loved the results, but he didn't see money in rehabilitation. Part of the reason that he didn't see money in rehabilitation was actually what made us um, um, be well ahead of its time. Uh, 
and therefore the things uh, didn't work as well as we hoped. And I would say that was for all the companies that were created around that period. None of them are winners at the moment. So I think that there is a lot of opportunity for newcomers in this space because the timing now, as you see the bigger companies coming and they are big, they have big resources and they have personnel and they have technology, but they are a little slower. But the timing uh, of today is much better than the timing that was 20 years ago. Sure, and then just really quick, a follow-up one, um, kind of piggy piggybacking off of that is, how do you see now we have the, the, the a lot or like a lot more research with personalized medicine. So how do you see personalized medicine interacting with rehabilitation robotics? Do you see it kind of growing together or kind of impeding its growth? I think they will be growing together. And um, um, because the robots are not, and we didn't have too much time to talk about it, but they, if you use a continuous passive motion machine, um, it doesn't have that much an impact on neurological recovery. So the patients need to be actively trying to make the movements. So you have an opportunity to have the robots change their controllers and adapt to the patient so that you would only assist when needed and you will challenge the patient to try to do more, which very much matches the concept of personalized medicine. Now, the, the, so uh, if you try to uh, employ a single solution uh, to the problem, it would likely not work or not be optimal. So I think personalized medicine would have a big um, added concept to that, not to mention now the, the tele aspects because with, with COVID-19, I think there is even more opportunities for you to do technology that would go to the home. Right. I would agree. Uh, thank you. Does anyone else have any questions? I think there's a little button where you can raise your hand or there's a question in the chat. So the question in the chat, it's from me. So I, I don't, they didn't rename themselves, but it goes, how does one go about getting initial seed funding? For example, he said starting with a thousand dollars, but for many tech based or biotech companies, much more is needed in order to actually start the company or for like a new college grad that doesn't have a lot of money? So um, I would, the best way to start, in my opinion, is small business administration. That's why I was showing you the model of the different ways that society organize the development. So it would give you, you can get money from say NIH through the small business administration to get a seed money to develop your first prototype. Without the first prototype, you won't be able to raise real money. So the only options that you have is either family and friends or uh, say an academic, some now um, institutions had created their own uh, VC funds, for example, Mass General Partners uh, here in the Boston area, they have their own fund that support internal ideas to grow. So it depends on the institution. Um, MIT doesn't have that. Um, MIT gives the ecosystem, but they don't actually put directly money in the companies. So you will have to identify these options, either friends and family, either you are in an institution that already have this type of um, organized internal support system for you to have seed money, or if you don't have either of the two, to take advantage of uh, quite unique here in the US in terms of the small business innovation program that would give you the seed money for you to grow to the level that then you can go to talk to the VCs. 
typical VCs are not interested in investing less than $10 million. Because for them, you are too much of a hassle if you just need a million dollars. It's the same amount of effort that they will put into organizing and checking you. And you turn out to be um, not going to grow as fast as they are looking for. You have to remember that VC funds have a termination date. So when you get money from a fund, that fund might be five years, 10 years, depending when in the cycle you got it. And by the end of it, they have to liquidate everything. So they have to sell everything and pay back the investors. So they have, um, say that you got into a fund that has some money left, but they only have two years left before a termination. So that's the timeline the VC fund is looking to exit. And um, if it doesn't look like you'll be able to do that, you won't have too much success. Right. There are angel investors and, and other things of that nature necessarily out or like out of, I suppose, venture companies, right? Right. The angel investors is what I was calling more friends and family. So you would have like a friend uh, or you go to an angel investor club and you would create a relationship with somebody that would trust you and they'll put a little money to make you grow enough to be able to go to the next uh, group. But the VC is not typically where you knock first unless you already have the prototypes and you are ready to, to try to grow faster. VCs are, in my opinion, ideal when you have everything ready and need to grow fast. Sure, thank you. Um, does anyone else have any more questions? Again, you can send them in the chat or you can just raise your hand. Just unmute, I guess. Yeah, I had, I had just kind of piggybacking off of that one. Um, I know nowadays there's a lot more like kind of online crowdfunding sources. I was wondering if you had any strong opinions on that, whether or not that would count more as like kind of the family and friends, like initial investment, or whether you think that's actually something like a viable option for startup companies to use as funds, or if it's kind of like a, like a potential pitfall. Um, I think it's the same thing as friends and family. So I'm putting angel investors, uh, crowdfunding, um, uh, family uh, and friends as the initial way for you to take off. I don't think that there is any pitfall in that. I think a lot will do with timing. Is your idea at the right timing or not? Now, one thing I want to mention is that most of the times, us, we are excited about the users. That's who we are designing the technology for. So I don't know what you do, Katarina, but let's assume that you are making new uh, implants to measure um, blood glucose, for example and you are excited about what you are doing and the people that you can help, are they the buyers? That's a question that I'm going to ask you. So you have to keep in mind one thing that is very important in this space of rehabilitation in general is that the users are not the buyers. And uh, many times we prepare the technology thinking about who we are excited. We are excited in helping people, but for the most part, depending on what you are doing, they are not the buyers, they are the users. And so in this space of rehab robotics, uh, all the patients that I interacted with, they love the technology, their family love the technology, but they are not the buyers, the hospitals are, the clinics are, and that creates a significant part of that gap that makes that valley of death. If you are able to um, do something where your user and the buyer are the same, your chances of success, in my opinion, would be much larger. 
Okay. Thank you. Um, does anyone else have any questions that they would like to ask? I can throw one more out there. I was so jealous. Maybe I cloned myself to Jim Patton is now here. <laughs> say hi. Oh, yes. Hi, Dr. Patton. Sorry, I see that you're Dr. Esmovi. Everyone's hi, Ego. How are you? Uh, um, hey, good I've been to see trying, you, Jim. I've been trying to get on for an hour now and uh, so failing. So uh, there's been some sort of technical mis misunderstanding. Anyway, I've been trying. So it's really good to see you, sir. Likewise. Um, but I didn't get to hear anything. So hopefully I'll be able to listen to the recording. So no yeah, relevant yeah. or intelligent questions that I can fire your way because I didn't get to see anything. Katarina, did you say you have another question? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to, I was going to ask um, specifically for, um, the for Bush's R and D model of development, I noticed. You know, I, I was wondering if you thought what maybe potential consequences, either positive or negative, there might have been from neglecting the social sciences and like more liberal arts in terms of maybe engineering ethics, or maybe how we perceive like the end user, like the buyers in those fields. Um, this is a difficult question because. Um, you know, they are always depend on what is your metric to measure. So if you look to the metrics of that I was showing, GDP, PPP, the countries that took off are all the ones that are focusing on the Bush model first. If you would separate the different models that I show, so I showed the model from Vannevar Bush that Japan adopted a variation, that Korea adopted a variation, and now China adopted as a variation, and Singapore also. Uh, and then you have the European model, where I said the money from the government go to the university that then trickle to industry, or like in the case of the German model, go to industry and then trickle to, um, um, to the academia. Um, you look, if you use the GDP PPP, you'll see that he, Van der Waar Bush model was probably very good. Now, if you use a different metric, then you can criticize that. So um, it's, you know, like uh, GDP PPP doesn't say anything about, for example, happy. Maybe the Europeans are happier than us, I don't know. Um, but so that's that's what I'm saying. But if you are looking for 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 the um, for that metric that is essentially like how much money you have in your pocket, uh, that metric seems to be adopted by all the countries that are taking off that are on the top of that curve. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions from anyone? I have one further question, but I don't know if anyone else has something else to ask. Um, okay, well, I guess I'll ask my question. So I was wondering, um, probably on like the last question, parting note type thing, how would you, or rather like, what advice would you give someone who, you know, I mean, a lot of people attending are students, you know, what advice would you give a student who, who thinks they have a great idea for something? Um, technologically based, right? And then going forward, how, how would they take those steps to make it an actual product? So um, I would answer this in two different ways. The first one is saying you have to keep moving forward because you won't get, you know, it's always easy for an older person like me to look back uh, and say, oh, now I know what I should have done. Uh, but at the time that I was in your shoes, I didn't know what I was doing. So I think you don't have an option except go forward and make the mistakes. The second thing is that I would uh, create that ecosystem 
where you can be talking to people that at least would try to um, give you information and try to minimize the mistakes that you might do. So those are two things that I think are very important. Um, A, that you cannot be afraid of making mistakes and you have to go forward. Otherwise, um, you won't push the boundaries, okay? The second thing is to have a network that you trust, that you can talk with and you can bounce ideas and uh, in different spaces, like, so how do you organize paperwork? How do you organize something like the basic processes in a company? How do you raise money? How do you um, organize uh, growth? How you manage people? All those things, we don't know. So it would be nice that you create a network of uh, people that you trust. And in many cases, this is why uh, the colleagues at uh, the Sloan School, the business school at MIT had shown that the more founders you have in a company, the bigger is the likelihood of your succeeding. So is it because why that might be the case? Maybe because if you are one person, your network, your network is limited to one size, but if you are three people, your network might be three times bigger and therefore you might get the better pieces of advice. Okay. Sure. Thank you so much. Um, if no one has any uh, further questions, I think we could end this here. Again, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to be here with us. I really enjoyed this lecture. I hope everyone else did. Um, and then concerning the recording, I'll be sending a recording to everyone. So Dr. Patton, you can revisit this at a later date. I did just see your email, I apologize. Um, and everyone else, of course, can revisit it. Um, so thank you all for attending our last Distinguished Lecture event of the year. I'm glad we could end on this note. Um, and I hope you guys all have a good rest of your day.